to go through everything. Yeah. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can, I think we've had a signal. So, has my mic come on? Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Can anyone not hear me? Cool. So, um, good afternoon. I hope everyone is having a lovely time at the festival so far. Um, I appreciate it. it's very sunny outside, but hopefully you're nice and cool and relaxing in here. Uh, my name's Phil Pierce. Uh, it's my friend and colleague, Harry Aurora, and we represent the Centre for Blast Injury Studies here at Imperial. And today we're going to talk to you a little bit about blast injury, what that means, and how we experiment and research it in the lab. Um, quick word of warning to start with. Um, there are some loud bangs, a couple on videos, half of the talk, and then one at the end, which will give you fair warning of, uh, but particularly those at the front, if you're off a nervous disposition, uh, just be a little bit aware of that. So at the Centre for Blast Injuries, we are housed across all faculties, so from medicine, engineering, shock physics, and we also collaborate with military medics like Phil in order to understand the injury mechanisms that occur uniquely in BLAST with the aim of trying to understand them to improve the way in which we treat them, but also the long-term rehabilitation further down the line, as well as some of the things which I work on, developing mitigating structures to prevent the injury in the first place. So that's a nice little, desk, nice little office. Some of you yeah. will, will see it. Uh, we are generously funded by the British Legion and have very close relationships with that on the basis that really our work is to benefit servicemen, both those who have been injured in the past and uh, for any future conflicts. So why do we need to do it? Well, essentially, Blasts happen really commonly, and we realised, certainly looking back in from to Iraq and, Afgan and Afghanistan, that blast is really the main reason that people were getting injured and getting killed. Uh, about two thirds, certainly, of Afghanistan of those deaths were caused by injuries. And Afghanistan, obviously, we're stopped, or as, certainly as far as our involvement has gone, we're stopped. Um, but these sort of injuries are, are still happening. And um, just to be slightly serious for a minute, this is um, this is only about three weeks worth. Uh, of a BBC search. So blast injuries are happening all the time and the, unfortunately as good as our expertise is at trying to mitigate them and trying to understand these injuries, the expertise at building them also increases and it's pretty widespread and they're relative, relatively straightforward to produce in order to create massive amounts of injuries. So, so what is an explosion? A lot of you might have visited our stand and might have seen a few of our demonstrations to highlight what it is. But essentially what you have is, in lots of shapes and forms, very solid or liquid propellants that are used as explosives. Once you give them an initial energy, it sets off a chain reaction, a detonation wave. And this causes a change of state within that material, rapid release of high pressure gases, which can generate a shock wave. And this is a very high intensity pressure wave, which can propagate outwards and cause injuries. So um, our health and safety apparently says we can't set off a bomb in here. Um, so we've got a simple experiment, uh, really just to show that that change in, change in volume caused by the gas. So can I have a volunteer, please? Yes, gentleman there. Hello, what's your name? Raheem, nice to meet you. Uh, so you've, checked, you've signed the wave, haven't you? <laughs> right. So, well, he, quick experiment. So, we've got two things in here, and this is something you can do at home. Uh, we've got some bicarbonate of soda, and we've got some vinegar. So, that's an acid and an alkali. Yep. And what's going to happen, we're going to combine those two together, and get going to get lots of carbon dioxide released. Okay, and we'll, hopefully, this works some of the time at home. Um, we're going to get good volume expansion of that gas, and we're going to get a little explosion. Okay? So I'm going to put it in here to keep the mess. What I want you to do yeah. is give that a good whack, give it a good punch right in the middle, yeah. and then we're going to shake it and we're going to see what happens. Okay? <laughs> Excellent. Right. Right, cross your fingers, because, say, if this doesn't work, we're both going to look silly. You more than me, you did it. I think you might have hit it too hard. Oh. <laughs> Be brave. <laughs> right. We've got
got a backup. Give it a second, give it a second. All right, so this is probably going to go in my hand. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully, you can all appreciate the expansion of the volume anyway. So this isn't really what, exactly what happens in a bomb. <laughs> but what you can appreciate is that that chemical reaction has caused a change of state that caused that expansion. Okay? Right, we're going to have one more go. Mm, probably be fine. Right. Another, another good whack of that one. <laughs> there we go, man. Thank you. So this is what a real explosion looks like. Yeah. Obviously, there's some side effects with this particular explosion, causing ground shock to set off that car alarm. The problem we have with blast is that it's, it's a bit more complicated than that, and lots of things happen at the same time. And lots of those different things can cause injury. So it gets broken down into various sorts of classes of injury, and that helps us research it. So primary blast, Harry's going to talk about it in a moment, but that's that shock wave that's being pushed out. Secondary blast is what we call the effect of all the, uh, would it be it fragments, shrapnel, anything that's flung out as a result of the blast that causes penetrating injury. And tertiary blast is really about people and things being thrown all over the place. So if you're thrown against a vehicle or thrown against a house or a house collapses on you, as a result of blast, you get injured that way. Quaternary blast is other stuff that we won't really talk about. Right, so here's a slowed down video of another open field explosion. And what you can see emanating from that fireball is also something called the shock wave. And so this is what we were talking about earlier when we say this high pressure gas is rapidly expanding and it cause, causes this push to generate a shock wave which propagates through, through the air around it. And what we're trying to research is how that particular wave uh, interacts with us. So we get some very particular injuries that are caused just by that primary blast wave. So, and this is one of them. So I have another box of chocolates <laughs> for the first correct guess of whereabouts in the body this is. Oh, well, that's. <laughs> I've had throats. Someone suggested me the other day it was the inside of a scrotum. <laughs> there you go, man. Next injury. So, really, this is one of the classical injuries of blast injury, and this is what we call blast lung. So, primary blast works mostly where there's a cavity full of air. So, those, those cavities are squidgy and they can compress. And the classic site of that really is in the lung. So, your lungs put together a tiny little air sacs called alveoli, and when the compression of the, air, the shockwave hits that, they all squeeze together and they pop. And what we get is little bits of bleeding in and around those air cavities, so you can see the middle of that chest is basically just full of blood, and that's little tears in the walls of the vessels that line the alveoli that bleed. So what happens after a while, and sometimes quite a few hours after someone's been exposed to blast, all this fluid leaks into their chest and they stop being able to breathe properly. So how do we explore this in our lab? So what we have, rather than setting off bombs in our labs, we have a nice device called a shock tube. And what this is is a, essentially a, compression, a compressed air-driven uh, uh, system. And so where you see this breach area, that's where we put a series of sacrificial diaphragms which will allow us to build up in high-pressure gas in the driver tube. And when that happens, it builds and builds and builds until a critical pressure. And then you have a high pressure gas meeting atmospheric. And this, again, then forms a shock which propagates down the barrel and then moves into our targets. And this is where we can explore various different tissues and cells to see how they respond to just the pure shock wave, independent of any fragments or solid impacts from other objects. So we can't bring that here because it's a bit big. Um, Oh, sorry, Harry, I forgot. We, ha we have some yeah. videos before we do that. One second. Yeah, so just to help you visualise what I mean by shockwave again, if you see the top left-hand video, we've taken some nice high-speed photography of the output from our shock tube. 
And what you should see is these dark lines indicating the shock wave. But as well as looking at what it happens to tissues, we can look at mitigating structures. And the other videos show a series of different mitigating uh, structures we put in the way to try and block that wave and reduce the amount of shock energy that gets through. And so hopefully you can see with those, the dark line isn't as strong, which indicates a lower pressure getting through. So we can't bring our shot tube because it's too big. So we have one of these instead. So I need another volunteer with a willing parent. <laughs> willing parent. So hopefully you're all familiar with the, uh, with the story of William Tell. <laughs> <laughs> who is forced to shoot the apple off his son's head. Uh, and this time the son is going to get his own back. So, Dad, can you stand about there for me? I want you to pop that onto your head. So, what's your name? So, Sorry, hello, my name's Phil. So, I want you to do... Have you, play, have you played with this in our stand? Yeah, I think so. Excellent. So, you should be a pro. So, in fact, let's start way back here. So, for anyone that hasn't seen one of these on the stand, this is a shop-bought air zooker. We've got uh, other ones that we make and which don't work quite as well, unfortunately. And all this does is really shoot a little packet of, of air. It sort of shows what we're trying to achieve with the shockwave. So all that is being fired from this is air. All yours. <laughs> no pressure, yeah? Nah. Wide. Yay! Do you want another go? Um, yeah. Right, let's see it fly off. Right, a bit closer. Right. Right. It always it always pulls up. So there you go. Pull. You pull now. You're missing. <laughs> right. Got it? <laughs> You're just shooting it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's broken. <laughs> just, just wiggle your head. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Chocolates to both of you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> right, moving on from there. So some of the other effects of the shockwave being generated is that they would interact with structures where we're inside. And so this is an, a classical video showing how if you're in a building and you didn't have very tough windows, they would shatter and fragments would come in and also cause injury. Now, nowadays, in a lot of buildings where we'd expect there to be a blast or potentially we now have things called laminated structures which mitigate fragments. But this is just another indicator of yeah. uh, so where fragments can be generated. Yeah, so these fragments basically go anywhere um, and can be made from anything. So a lot of the fragments that might be from the, from the actual casing of the device so a lot of the bombs will be in some sort of canister, and those, can, those outside canister fragments off, and it's shot out at very high speed. But equally, very common things are added to these in order to basically make them more deadly. So I'm sure everyone's heard of a nail bomb, It's basically one of these with nails in it. But certainly what, uh, what we see a lot of in Afghanistan was, was simple household things like nuts and bolts, or rocks, or stones. And these are really, really horrible injuries, because unlike bullets, which are nice and aerodynamic, and smooth and round, and create relatively nice wounds, these things turn in the air and they, they mash up the tissues and often they can be contaminated, so with mud or dirt or germs and really horrible, nasty infections come about. So likewise to the shock tube that I showed before, we can also replicate the effects of these fragments or projectiles uh, being fired into people or tissues. So here's an example of a gas gun, another uh, compressed gas-driven device which allows to throw any projectiles. But... My, 
although I'm just showing some water there, which is a bit of fun, it does indicate some of the concepts that you see in tissues like the lung, where you've got multiple interfaces, liquid and air, lots of solids, and it creates a much complicated problem as well. And here we see other examples of projectiles perforating different materials, which again um, shows the types of damage that can be induced. So typically what we do to prevent this is we wear body armour. And so if you come to our stand, you'll see some real-life body armour worn by our soldiers. And they're typically made of things like Kevlar, which is a nice, strong material, which is uh, well designed to catch bullets. And so here's an example of some Kevlar material being used to stop a typical fragment flying at a several hundred metres per second. Oops. So the third type of blast you talk about is tertiary blast. Now, so this is really things falling on you, you being thrown into things, things being hit, and it's really that, that blunt force. So this is just one sort of sort of it. So uh, a vehicle, oh sorry, a, a building is hit by blast, and parts of that vehicle, parts of that blast fall down. We have a particular interest at the centre in actually looking at vehicle blast. So you can imagine that if you're in a vehicle, be it a tank or a car, that goes over a landmine or an IED that's buried in the ground, you get very, very high forces that are pushed up through the car. So that's sort of like a car crash, so big head-on collision, except it's going that way, and it's going much, much faster and with a lot more energy. So what we what we've tried to do... Oh. So it's quite hard for us to do that in the lab, as I'm sure you'd appreciate. Um, but what we have done is come up with uh, a piece of kit that sort of simulates some of it. Uh, so this is uh, Anubis uh, device, which is that video going? There we go. So this is a device that, that uses highly compressed air to basically push a platform up really fast. And this, we've really used it mostly for looking at lower ends for foot and ankle injuries. And essentially you see that the, path, the, the platform beneath the foot and beneath the boot is being driven up really, really quickly to simulate the effect of a vehicle being hit by a mine from underneath. So this device has actually been calibrated against real explosives done in the field so we get this, the correct accurate accelerations and decelerations that you'd experience. And in this particular video, what we're showing is how, depending on your posture, for instance, that can severely affect the outcome of your injury. Here, seeing the effects on your heel again. Further to that, by understanding the formation of this injury, we can then develop, again, further mitigating structures to prevent that critical force being reached or potentially over a certain period of time. Because the thing with blast is it happens in a split second, in a microsecond. And what we need to do is, A, draw that out so the body can accommodate certain movements as well. And so that's what we do by developing these different floor materials as well for the heel. So how does this actually all come together and what do we actually do? Well, we have a set of clinical priorities. So these are really things that uh, have been found by people like me, the clinicians in the centre. And we've got a list of several things that I think are really important for us and we're really targeting our research towards. So first off, head injury. We know that head injury is particularly common with blast and in all sorts of scenarios, both in people that are hit by the blast and people that are in vehicles that are hit by blast. And here at Imperial, uh, part of the centre are looking at basically very intelligent um, ways of imaging the brain to really make sense of this blast because it's all very well when you've got an extra of a bone, you can see that it's broken, it's slightly more difficult to look at head injury. And so that's one of the areas that we're looking at. And coupled a lot with head injury is also hearing. And so one of the main problems with former service people is that they start to be disorientated and not be able to follow conversation with an individual. Say in your noisy room, you won't be able to follow what your friend is, to, what your friend is saying. And so what we've been able to do here is trying to map your brain activity to try and understand where that link has gone between your hearing and your, your brain. So both the pelvis and the spine, you can just about see a little spine on the, on the right there, um, are injured both in, in all sorts of type of blast. So we know that people that are sat in vehicles that are hit by blast, basically their spine is all wedged together and lots of them get, sort of, get lots of fractures down their back. 
And equally, we know that people basically injure their pelvis, and that's by people who are walking onto landmines, uh, and again, people that are in vehicles. And uh, one of my colleagues in the centre is looking at the patterns of injury that we get to try and work out, well, actually, what sort of injuries do you get if someone sat down? What sort of injuries do we get if they're standing up? And how can we protect against those injuries? So we've heard a bit about blast lung, and there's several mechanisms at play here from the physical tearing to the bursting of the tissue. And what we're trying to do is to try and understand how we find this moderate to medium level injury where you start to develop swelling and fluid accumulation to the, the devastating injury where we can try to develop protection as well. So we've already shown some of the videos of, of feet being blasted. And it was well recognized quite early on with the sensor that this is one of the sort of the signature injuries of being hit by blast, particularly within a vehicle. And some of these injuries, they might not be as sexy as, say, lung injuries or head injuries, but actually, long term, we know that people who have had these sort of horrible foot and ankle injuries of blast basically do really badly. Uh, and so addressing that with things like new boots or with addressing uh, the vehicles themselves can make a massive difference long term to people with this sort of injury. Uh, this, this injury in particular is called heterotopic ossification. And what that actually is, is when you su suffer from multiple traumas, it can, from a blast, it can initiate a, a, a certain change in your physiology where you can start to form bone in places where you shouldn't. So if you imagine around your, in your muscles, you start to form platelets of bone, and this can be very painful and leads to multiple surgeries to uh, prevent that. What we're trying to do is try and understand the molecular changes which are occurring, which initiate the formation of bone where it shouldn't be occurring. And that's what we're doing with our cell and tissue models in the lab. And finally, amputation. So lots of amputations occur because of these blasts. And a lot of our work, as well as looking to prevent the blasts themselves uh, or to try and mitigate the blasts, is actually working with people who've sustained blast injury already. So quite a lot of our work is, is aimed both at rehabilitation and also trying to help out with things like prostheses. So people that have had um, amputations and are fitted with prostheses get quite a, lot of, quite a lot of problems, and part of our work is trying to improve the technology involved with them. So with that, actually, um, we want to make a big shout-out. So, so some of you may know um, this is Dave. Um, Dave Henson is former Ar Ar sorry, former army captain uh, who was injured in Afghanistan, but now actually works in our centre doing his PhD on prosthetic design, um, and is also a Paralympic athlete. Uh, and he and the rest of the team have actually started the Invictus Games today in Orlando. So we want to wish the best of luck to him. Right. Um, we're not going to have a volunteer for this, uh, because quite frankly, we're scared of it ourselves. Um, don't try this one at home. Um, so the loud bang that I talked about, it'll be this one. Um, there will be a bit of a delay once we've done it, and we don't know exactly how long that delay will be. Um, so we can't say what will go off. What I will say is if everyone, particularly those that are close, can come, don't put your fingers in your ears because I don't want any ruptured eardrums, but just be wary that it will be quite loud. So... This experiment really is to look at that secondary blast that we talked about. So what we're hopefully going to see is the energizing of fragments by the explosion. So we're using liquid nitrogen, and we're going to pour this into a bottle. And what will happen is that as the liquid nitrogen warms up, and after a little while, we don't know how long, that expanded bottle will pop and we'll energize the fragments that we're going to introduce onto it. It's not glass, I promise you. Phil, come here. <laughs> the bottle's moving. Can you bring the bottle back? Yeah. 
That should be enough, isn't it? Good. It's coming up. Okay, it's probably good. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Wait. So probably about two minutes. And now we just wait ever so patiently. So this will, this will illustrate what we're talking about when people fill their explosives with all sorts of fragments. So you see these balls flying off, hopefully, <laughs> much like they do. Uh, do you guys not bring visors? I promise you, it will go. It's, it's done the first expansion. Yeah. So right now, that liquid nitrogen is trying to expand out. It's coming down to room temperature and trying to form itself into a gas. And so now you can hear it start to expand, but I advise you to soon start covering your ears. <laughs> when I hear the second one, then it'll probably go. Yeah, it's creaking. So has anyone got any nice holidays planned? Are you going to have a look? No. <laughs> Should have picked a longer track, shouldn't I? We're going to be bang on half past.
probably turn the music off before I go mad. Yeah. And then we can actually hear it there. I mean, it hasn't leaked, has it? Right. It will go. Yeah. But I don't know when. So if anyone has got any questions in the meantime, keep one eye on that. Anyone got any good questions whilst we wait? I think everyone's too scared. What? Where are we going? Did you hear something? That was actually the best one we've had, so um, it was worth the wait. Right, that's us done. Any questions? Sir? How do you help long-term recovery from blood injury to the lung? Um, so actually, long-term long um, from the lung, it doesn't, if, if, if someone survives, actually they don't tend to have any long-term problems from it. Um, so and most of the lung treatment really is supported. That, that blood and that fluid basically after a while, just, just it goes away by itself. The, the biggest risk is probably immediately. If someone uh, survives long enough to get supplemental oxygen and if necessary, get onto a ventilator, um, it's, it's treated so way. It's, it's treated in a very similar way to um, other forms of lung disorder that aren't associated with blast, things like adult respiratory distress syndrome, if everyone's had that. So, uh, and then once someone's off that ventilator, lung, their lungs have recovered long term, not so much problem with, with, with those. Um, so the, the major, the more, the more significant long-term uh, sequelae are with the amputations, the foot and ankle, and then with the head and, and, head and um, hearing, really. Sir? Um, you mentioned earlier on head loss in people. Um, tell me, is it possible to have uh, five or six uh, having the imagery of clinical characteristics affect the body? Is that developed before? Harry? Uh, huh? Yeah. So it is actually used in one of the three tiers of uh, lower limb protection. And you'll be able to see that actually on our stand. We actually use that as a first layer to protect from debris and dirt getting through. But in terms of catching bullets and things like that, there's a full range of materials which are being developed to try and optimize um, protecting against fragments. But in the case of blast, as you've seen, there are three, there are three major modes whether it's from a solid impact, a fragment, but also the blast wave. So potentially some traditional fabrics might not be optimized for all three. And so that's why we're looking at alternatives depending on where you're looking around the body, whether it's on the feet or the chest or the head. So okay. it, it does vary throughout. Well, it, not, not completely going with that, but in terms of energy dissipation and how it propagates through your body, um, not all forms of the waves that go in are always damaging. So we're trying to break it down to understand how the different components cause the injury. So potentially, we don't have to stop everything that comes in, our, in its path. And that's why, always, that's why also the strongest and toughest material isn't always the best for, for that application because it could cause more harm than good. And there's a bit of a balance with you as well, both with the armor, the personal armor, and uh, to, to vehicles, you can keep piling on armor and armor and armor and armor, and you'll get protection, but you won't be able to move. Um, and so a lot of the engineering is trying to really to, to balance that and to optimize mobility and, and fighting ability against protection. Uh, Harry, do you want to go first? Well, I guess, um, so I was already working on structural materials against blast. So I did my former studies on PhD on naval structures, trying to optimise them against blast. However, we're quite decoupled from what you're trying to protect. And so when working on body armour again, I was trying to design things which would stop a bullet, but then what about the energy that goes through the body? So 
to get more engaged with what I was trying to protect that brought me over to get into, get into this side of research. Uh, and I, so I'm a, I'm a surgeon, I'm a general surgeon um, uh, with an interest in trauma. And uh, effectively BLAST, certainly within the military environment, is, is such a big component. Um, and it says the, the major wounding mechanism or has been in, in the last couple of conflicts and will be increasingly in, in the next. Um, and it sort of fit very much within my interest really. We do, yeah, we do. Um, neither of us are, are directly involved in it, but as a centre, we do we do work uh, with the rehab. And so, a lot of that is um, changing the prosthetic design. You know, we don't do the rehab ourselves, uh, but we help those that do. Um, mostly with, with with helping the design and mechanics of certain things. And I said, Dave uh, Henson is uh, and others um, with a similar interest are working a lot on prosthetic design and to so, say so reduce things like the heterotopic ossification that, that, that Harry mentioned is, is a real problem for those that have had uh, blast injuries to the limb because it uh, worsens fitting of prostheses and things like that. But just, just to add to that, in terms of the first response to in your emergency medicine, that sort of procedures have all been improved over time through experience in these conflicts. So that is also something we're learning from from this process. Thank you, Dr. Burke, the <laughs> centre manager for the Centre for Blast Injuries. Um, we know, as you already said, we know that blast is a, um, it's not limited to warfare, so there's an awful lot of it, uh, unfortunately, that is happening around the world as a result of conflicts. Um, Equally, um, what we try and do is, is translate some of this work, so both the mechanics work, so the laboratory work, to a uh, civilian environment where we can. Uh, and that means we, we are hoping to start collaborating increasingly with the civilian trauma centres to try and find ways that we can apply similar sort of work to, yeah. to civilian environments. Because the only difference between BLAST and any other form of trauma is the levels of energy and the timescales over which these energies are delivered to the body. So by understanding this very extreme case of injury, we can sort of work backwards because we've fully understood this case to work backwards towards more common events such as road traffic accidents and other forms of trauma we're familiar with. So at the back. Why could we? It's, there's, there's diffraction of the light um, through, the, through the very high compression of the air. Um, Harry can probably enlighten yeah. us further. It's, it's because, because there's a high pressure wave, the density locally is, is different, and so therefore the, the light bends. And so in the videos I was showing from our shock tube, we use a single plane of light and sort of polarise that to allow us to pick up that density change. Uh, it's the shock. The shock wave is, is very, very quickly. It's very, very quick. But um, it depends how far a person is. So the um, the shock wave um, decays very, very rapidly. So it, it decays according to um, the cube of the distance from it, um, and the fragment is, is lossy. So it's by the square. So if you're depending on the blast, of course, and depending on the environment. But if you're 200 meters away from a conventional blast, you're very unlikely at all to have any primary blast injury but you may be hit by NGIS fragments. But certainly, if you're within range, the primary, the primary shock wave is far quicker than the fragments. In, in, I think most people probably have seen photographs in film of the nuclear explosion in Kiev. I think there are two, two blasts in there. Mm. Um, and you see how they swing back and they swing towards the palm tree. Yeah. Is that because of the negative pressure? Exactly, yeah. We did, yeah. We did have a little graph in that, but. But we, but we took it out. But you get a, a very rapid and very high um, pressure increase, which, which forces the compression goes out, and it forces the local air that's already there out of the way. And so you create a relative vacuum, uh, which in the context of regular blast is not that much and doesn't really have a great impact, we don't think. But as you say, with the nuclear blast, it's so huge that you do get this very um, marked vacuum effect. Yeah. It's typically up to about a fifth at, at most of the overpressure that you get a negative pressure forming. Um, but, but yeah, it's interesting to look at that. That could be another um, cause of injury as well. Yeah. 
Dr. Burke. Do we need volunteers for studies? Uh, do we yes. need volunteers for studies? Yes. Yes. <laughs> not, not, not for the BLAST experiments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we also, so I'm housed in the Department of Bioengineering and we're, uh, a few of our PhD students are running clinical studies on the biomechanics of how you walk and move. Uh, and the purpose of this is for trying to understand how, as you age, how different movements, which we take for granted, um, can become more difficult. And so he's looking for volunteers over 18 um, to subscribe to his study. And you'll be kitted up with markers to allow you to visualize how you walk and move um, and conduct everyday tasks. Um, so you can learn a bit about yourself as well. We have, I don't have the details on, but we have posters on our stand if anyone yeah. is interested in, in having a 3D scan. Any more questions? I think there's one over there. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to connect yourself, or is there any way, like, is it good to get down, or like, yeah. to run away? Uh, yes, so the, the best thing is probably just to get down the floor. It, it, it will limit it, obviously, it, it, there's nothing that will necessarily save you if you're, if you're close enough, but it will limit it. Um, what is interesting is how buildings, obviously, affect you, and it, that depends very much on the building. So, in, you know, they talk about earthquakes and where you should stand and things. Where you should stand in a building depends on the building, unfortunately. So lots of work actually is going into designing buildings because we know that cities are the target of attacks like this. Um, so building designers now are, are very savvy to, to make, trying to make them, trying to make them bomb proof. Yeah. If the bomb goes off, get down if you can. But it happens pretty quickly, so it's quite hard. Anyone else? I suppose these Hollywood depictions of the hero and heroine running away from a bomb blast are, are absolute rubbish because it's impossible to do, I would think, because of the millions of cells of a second, whatever it takes to go off and catch them up. Yeah, yeah. A lot, yeah. <laughs> but, but some of the things which they do do in terms of getting thrown by, by the high pressure gas, some of that could happen, but whether they'd walk away from it the way they do, perhaps not. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you always see them being thrown and they have a bit of soot and then they get on fighting and you, yeah, you, you don't see them 24 hours down the line when they've got their horrible blast lung. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yes, yeah. Not sure you mentioned the shockwaves themselves Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the shockwaves, they, they do, they have a fairly limited amount of damage that they do. So they tend to uh, affect... Um, areas that are themselves filled full of gas, because those areas which basically compress and implode. So the classic areas are the ears um, and the lungs, and then also within the bowel. So the, the parts of the bowel that are filled with gas can be affected. Um, it's within the context, it's, it's always quite, we try and break these apart, and experimentally we break them apart. They all sort of happen together. But the classic descriptions of someone that um, had been injured by a blast without any fragments was that someone would die sort of without a mark on them. Um, and those people that died either of, of lung injury, uh, or if it's their die it would have been sort of catastrophic lung injury that caused just by the shockwave without anything else. So. Um, something you've just said reminded me of uh, reading about something from Napoleonic era navies. Yes. Where sailors were discovered dead without a mark on yeah. them. And it was put down to wind or fall. Yeah, exactly. So the, the classic description, uh, we actually have our, our historian in residence, uh, so a, few, uh, a few rows behind you, uh, who's very interesting, but one, one of the classic descriptions uh, by actually a, a Nazi scientist um, in the late 30s was um, of a, a slash without a sword, was, was how they described it. But yeah, it's exactly so, people, people dying apparently without a mark on them. Time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the rest of the sunny day. Um, if any, you've got any volunteers to clear up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you've got any further questions, please come and see us on the stand. Um, and for any more information, please follow the centre uh, on Twitter. Thank you.